Do you think there is enough regulation at the moment or perhaps too much? Now that you're somewhat removed from that job, What's your current view? Sure, so it's, it's a great question, but I think it's hard to answer in many ways because of course our view of regulation and whether there's enough or too little is informed um, by our sort of general philosophy about the role of government and, and is government a good thing or a bad thing? Um, and you would imagine, I think, that as a lifelong regulator, I think that regulation that ensures transparency in the markets, protects investors, protects uh, against fraud and uh, assures that we have smooth operation of our capital markets, that financial intermediaries are well capitalized, that exchanges work well, that the clearance and settlement mechanisms all work well, um, are essential to our financial system and to our economy. And regulation has a, has a big role to play in ensuring that those things happen. So um, do we always get it right? <coughs> Absolutely not. Um, could we calibrate things differently? Could we understand the benefits and the burdens? more precisely when we're doing regulatory work? Absolutely. But I think um, that you, we have to give some credit to, to regulation for the fact that we have the deepest and most liquid capital markets in the world that have the highest level of investor confidence in their integrity. And, and so it's obviously business that makes it all happen, but I think it's regulation that gives us that, that level of credibility that we might not otherwise have. And I completely understand your view on it and agree with many points, but there will be people out there who will say, look, regulation absolutely has a place. It is essential. But when there is too much, when there is all of that regulatory red tape, it starts to slow down the very essence of business and the freedom of business to do what it does. What would your response have been as SEC chairman to that particular critique? So it's, it's always a balance, right? And, and another way to say what you've just said is that a regulation stifles innovation and it, and it kills opportunity. And, and does that happen sometimes? I, I'm sure it does. And I know we're going to talk a little bit about Bitcoin and there's an innovation I'd love to see regulation kill. But um, <laughs> not blockchain and, and we'll make we'll that distinction. That. <laughs> um, um, but so can it have some impacts? Can it slow innovation? Can it prevent some innovation? Yes, but it can also prevent grievous harm um, to investors and, and as a result of the financial system. Our, our economy is, is built on trust. Our financial system, our capital markets are built on trust. If we can't trust what a company is saying about their financial prospects, about their operations, about their strengths and weaknesses, why would we ever put our, our capital behind them? And so for regulators, it's always that balance between what's enough regulation to assure that basic level of integrity what's not so much that it's just too costly to innovate, too costly to go public, and, um, and you try to get it right. And as a tiny follow-on to that, and forgive me, but can regulators regulate themselves? Well, um, sure, and, um, and they do, and there's lots of other forces out there that, that, um, that put pressure on regulators. I testified before Congress um, just under 50 times in four years as SEC chairman. That must have been fun. That was a, that was a lot of being regulated by somebody else, even right. though I was the regulator. Yeah, it was a, it was a blast. <laughs> um, <laughs> if we were having wine, I would tell you stories, but I, I won't. Um, so look, people who, who go into these positions, at least in the administrations that I participated in, which are Reagan, Bush, Clinton, and Obama, um, do it because they believe they have um, something that is of service to give to the American people. And that's a pretty strong regulator in and of itself right. because you're a stewardship of public trust and you better not screw that up. Yeah. So I think there's that force on us. There's congressional oversight. There's the media that, you know, plays a hugely important role in keeping regulators honest. And, yeah. uh, and, and then there's the processes that are built around regulation. Public comment periods, when you propose a rule and the public gets to weigh in. Um, hearings within the agency to bring out the details. So there's, there are forces of regulation on regulators. So with all that said, the current administration has been very vocal about trying to repeal and roll back uh, many regulations. For every new regulation, I think the idea is, is to chop out three or four others. I forget the exact number. 
when you sit there reading that, I can see from your face already, um, what are your thoughts? So, look, it's a great political line. Um, we're going to kill, you know, two regulations for every new one. Um, but that's such a blunt instrument. And, um, you know, the, coming out and saying we're repealing Dodd-Frank, well, let's, let's think about that. Let's take it apart and do the kind of analysis you would want a regulator implementing a reg to do. Let's do the same kind of analysis before we take any of them away. And I think those kind of bold political statements um, evidence a real lack of appreciation of history. We went through a financial crisis that devastated millions and millions of Americans. And we found flaws and weaknesses in our financial system that absolutely had to be remedied. Was it done perfectly? No. And, and I know we, we'll talk a little bit about some of the particular rules, but banks needed more capital. We needed heightened supervision of banks. We needed protection for um, uh, debtors, uh, for, for customers in, in the credit markets. We needed a lot of changes to our system that were laid bare problems of which were laid bare by the financial crisis. And, and to just come in and say, oh, we're going to get rid of all of it um, because it's, it's a burden, it, it, it's just too simple. Right. It's too, too generalistic, isn't yeah. it? You, um, you mentioned Dodd-Frank, so let me just touch on that a bit. There, there were many people at the time who believed that Dodd-Frank was almost like, you know, the horse has bolted, so now let's close the gate. It was, it was too much and it was too late. Do you think Dodd-Frank in its current state still stands up to the pressures? I do think so. I mean, look, again, there are things that, that need to be recalibrated or changed, for sure, and as you would expect. Dodd-Frank was a massive undertaking, right? It was over 1,000 pages. The SEC alone had more than 100 rules to write. Um, were they all carefully thought through by Congress? I'm afraid not. Um, were they carefully thought through by the agencies? Probably. But the world changes around us, and um, the needs of regulation have to adapt and change as well. So I, I, think, um, I think there's a lot in it. There's more in it that's good than isn't. And the idea that we finally brought over the counter derivatives into the daylight at the core of the financial crisis, the fact that we now have hedge fund regulation and oversight, the fact that we have better capital and more capital in our banks, that we have a Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, these are all very positive things. Right. And if you had to put money on it, and I hate to put you in this position, do you think Dodd-Frank is safe? Oh, no. Uh, although, you know, d during the last couple of years of the Obama administration, I think the Republicans passed a bill every week repealing it um, <laughs> in, in the House. And, of course, the Senate um, didn't, wisely didn't go along. But, no, it's not safe. And, and so the Treasury Department put out a roadmap, actually, last year. Um, to what they, what they intend to change. And, and some of the things probably make sense. Um, alleviating some of the burdens on, on community banks probably makes sense. Right. Maybe some of the access to capital provisions that they'd like to see change makes sense. But, but you know, making the stress tests easier on banks, what, what purpose does that serve? Um, it's like sticking our heads in the sand, not wanting to understand what's the worst case scenario, which regulators should always be prepared to handle. So I think, um, I think we'll see what they actually are able to undo. Um, there will be an effort, for sure, to do that. And let's hope it's more about recalibration than it is about you know, taking a bazooka to it. Right. I, I, we were talking in the green room before, and I, it's fascinating how in today's market, I investors and activists are almost a form of unofficial regulator. And they're driving big conversations and big regulatory ideas around things like climate and diversity. Right. And you're working with Mike Bloomberg right now, aren't you? I am. Um, so uh, investors are kind of the secret weapon here, right? They're the, they're the shadow regulators in a way um, because they have real influence directly through engagement with public companies on issues they care about. And Larry Fink from BlackRock has been very good at this. And Vanguard is stepping up and others. Um, um, so they have the ability to engage, but they also have the ability to propose through shareholder proposals very specific things. And in the climate area, which is where I work with Mike Bloomberg, we've seen at Occidental Petroleum, at ExxonMobil, at um, Pennsylvania Power and Light, shareholder proposals around scenario analysis of climate impact past. And those companies have to do two-degree scenario testing now, and they have to, uh, in accordance with the Paris Agreement even though we withdrew from the Paris Agreement. So shareholders have enormous voice right now, and it's really important. 
specifically in the climate area, uh, again, this started before the election in the US, the G20 asked the Financial Stability Board, which is the umbrella group of all the heads of central banks and um, treasury and finance ministries of the G20, to look at what we could do to ensure better disclosure by public companies, asset owners, asset managers, banks, and insurers about the potential financial impact on their businesses from climate change. Right. And could we develop a framework for disclosure that would really help um, investors in particular make good capital allocation decisions. If I'm going to look at the transportation sector and I want to understand what's the risk of climate change, I want to be able to look across the whole sector and pick the companies I think are managing or mitigating or understanding that risk the best, that's where I'm going to put my investment dollars. And so we developed a framework that was presented to the G20 in July. It was extremely well received, except by the United States. Um, because we don't believe in climate change anymore. We don't believe it could actually have long-term financial impact on our, our, on our businesses. But nonetheless, 250 global companies, the largest asset managers in the world, um, the um, largest public companies in the world, endorsed the framework. And now we're working with them on, on implementing it. And it really is it's quite scalable. It works in every G20 jurisdiction. And essentially what it does is, it, in very general terms, it says to companies, Tell us what you're doing about governance of climate-related financial risk. How are you measuring it? How does the board interact on this issue? What is management doing? How is it incorporated in your risk management protocols and procedures and practices? How does climate-related risk factor into your strategic planning? And how do you measure all of this? And, and we think it will, it will make a huge difference. It's gaining tremendous traction in allowing investors to understand Climate change is going to have financial impacts on a lot of different industries. Perhaps every industry, some much more than others. Investors need to understand that risk. And are you seeing, with your work in this area, more attention on organizations who are preparing for the oncoming climate change that they see, or organizations that are in some way, through their actions and through their operations, are trying to alleviate uh, the climate change threat that's, that seems to be there? So, so both. Um, look, customers actually care about this issue. They care that they're, they're buying products from companies that are doing well in this space. Employees care deeply, especially the millennial generation. Yeah. They are highly engaged on this issue, and that's one of the things Mike Bloomberg will say when, when he interviews young people who are coming to work at Bloomberg. One of the first things they always say is, what are we doing about the environment? How green is this company? Mm -hmm. So. Customers care, um, employees care, shareholders care deeply. And we're seeing that through increased numbers of shareholder proposals that ask companies to stress test their business against different climate uh, change scenarios. And we're seeing it in letters from people like Larry Fink at BlackRock to CEOs where they say, this is the number one subject of engagement for us um, in the coming year. And we want to know what you Exxon or whoever, Oracle, are doing um, about climate change. And it's interesting because with this much attention on climate change from both, as you've already pointed out, the employee and the investor uh, perspectives, is there even a need for regulation of organizations in this space because the pressure is so intense now? I hope there isn't a need because there's no chance in the United States for the next three years. We, remember, we've just taken all the climate data down off official websites and you're not allowed to use those words apparently in government today. But um, so I hope there's not a need for regulation. I hope that this investor pressure and business having an opportunity to step up and lead in a way that will earn it a lot of credibility will, will be enough. Throughout Europe, there's much more of pressure towards, even though they're way ahead of us on these issues, there's much more pressure towards actual regulatory approaches. But we, the framework we developed is a voluntary framework and certainly um, is implementable by companies across the globe without having the regulatory mandate to do so. So we've definitely touched on climate change a lot, but a, a similar area that drives so much passion, of course, is diversity. Um, again, from your perspective, and you sit on all these boards and that you've been at the SEC, where do you think we are on the diversity question? Do we need to be regulated? So 
um, the very first set of rules we did when I got to the SEC, and everyone's going to say, oh, of course the woman did those rules, but <laughs> was about um, disclosure by public companies of diversity. How did you pick people to be on your board? What do they bring to the board? Um, and how did you, the board, think about diversity in the context of, of gender, race, and also diversity of experience? And those rules were actually necessary because um, you might recall that leading up into the financial crisis, it was a little shocking to look at the boards of major, complex financial institutions and find that we had NBA players on those boards because they were very cool people for the CEO to play golf with. Nice. Not to suggest that they're not very smart and hardworking people, but when you're looking at the complexity of an investment bank with a big book of over-the-counter derivatives, those might not have been the skill sets we actually needed to have on those boards. So we did these rules to require companies to essentially justify having the NBA player um, who was on the board. And, uh, and, and so I think that, that helped. We knew we were never going to have, we're not going to have mandates in this country. We're not going to have quotas as they do in some European countries. Should we? Should we have those? Well, look, we're making virtually no progress. Um, Women earn 57% of the masters, uh, bachelors, and PhDs in this country. We are 50% of the workforce. The empirical evidence of board of company performance when there are women on boards is is overwhelming. Higher returns on invested capital, higher returns on equity, higher returns on sales, fewer restatements. Uh, you know, across the board, all those things are true when there are more women on the board. Um, the business imperative is there. Yet we haven't budged from about 19% of boards, corporate board seats are held by women. So, you know, at some point, I suppose we'll entertain the, the discussion more seriously about whether we should have quotas. I just don't see it happening in the U.S. But again, I do see institutional investors demanding that companies step up on this issue. And again, um, to, to cite BlackRock, Larry Fink said that. Um, they will be deeply troubled by any company they've invested in that doesn't have at least two women on the board. And the company should expect their active engagement on that issue. So institutional investors, again, will drive a lot of this. That, that activism is, is very strong, it's very powerful, and it, and it never goes quiet. No. Um, you mentioned a few moments ago cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, and you, you, you staked your claim pretty quickly right there and then. <laughs> yes. Take us through it. First of all, I mean, you, you must be in awe of, of, this, uh, of this innovation. It, it's come from Ooh. nowhere. And, and awe is one word. <laughs> um, okay, tell us your thoughts. So look, uh, um, even for a layman like me, we have to separate blockchain yes. from Bitcoin. Let's I think start that's with going, going. Really, okay. really important. Lots of very real businesses are putting a lot of resources behind understanding blockchain and what it can do for them. Banks, stock exchanges, I, I sit on the board, as you mentioned, the London Stock Exchange. We're looking at it very seriously because for payments, settlement of securities transactions, trade reporting, there's tremendous promise. And in areas like healthcare, um, supply chain, um, transportation, there's enormous opportunity in blockchain. And so I think something that um, I am in awe of and, and I, I won't claim to understand it nearly as well as everybody here, but this distributed ledger technology, to, to answer one of your quiz That's questions, right. <laughs> is, right. um, is, is very promising. It's very strong. I'm going to pause you for a second because I want to make sure everyone in the room knows that after this session at 11 a.m. today in New York Ballroom West, we have a whole session on blockchain. So if you're interested and you can see the level of support we're getting from Mary Shapiro on this topic, uh, then make sure you attend that session at 11 a.m. today. So that's blockchain. blockchain. So um, Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies, I think, are a very different story. They are plagued by enormous volatility, um, by opacity, this anonymity. I, anonymity always scares me. They have valuation issues. They have custody issues. They have fraud and manipulation issues. Mm -hmm. And they have cyber hacking issues that have, have you know, been bidding big headlines. It's still a small asset class. I think there were $4 billion in, in initial coin offerings done last year, and maybe the entire <coughs> cryptocurrency space. Um, I've seen numbers, um, government estimates of about 400 billion. So not a big asset class, especially compared to gold um, or other currencies. But if you're one of those retail investors who got sucked in by the hype and bought a lot of Bitcoin at $10,000, you're in for a wild ride. And at the end of the day, 
you may have nothing. And, um, and as a lifelong regulator, that scares the hell out of me right. um, because it's, it's going to hurt real people in a very profound way. I'm a little disappointed in the regulators, and I, I, I hate to ever say that. On the, on the enforcement front, I think the SEC has done some really good cases on initial coin offerings. By the way, that $4 billion raised was mostly raised in violation of the federal securities laws because cryptocurrencies may well be securities, and these, of course, weren't registered or, or regulated by the SEC. CFTC has done a couple of cases on Bitcoin Ponzi schemes. That's a really good development. That's a fun one. Um, but, but beyond that, I haven't seen either of these agencies really enthusiastic about expanding their mandate and trying to actually regulate this, this innovation. I, I hear from so many concerned parties that the, the entire value of Bitcoin is based on the fact that it is not regulated, that it has got this anonymity. Right, so think money laundering. I right. mean, think sanctions violations. There's all sorts of things about that alone that I think are huge red flags for regulators. Yeah. And then we saw uh, some moves from, I think, Russia and China making noises about basically banning all trade in Bitcoin. And every time a bit of news like that breaks, Bitcoin drops $3,000 right. and then bounces up again. And if you just put your life savings in it, and maybe your life savings was $30,000, that's, that's a pretty big hit. In China, they have um, no tolerance for this. No. And, and rightfully so for many reasons, but one of which is they have enormous retail participation in markets like this. And so it's, again, it's real people who get hurt uh, when the bottom falls out. So to finish our conversation on, on uh, cryptocurrency, what's your prediction? Because there are many that believe this is just the beginning and it's going to become huge. And there are an equal number who say once regulators get their act together and they start closing the doors, it's, it's done. I think it's. Pro I, I think and hope actually that it's the latter, that we'll take what's good about the underlying technology in blockchain, and be able to utilize that in ways that are just transformative for business, and, and I think can be incredibly exciting. And I hope regulators shut the door on the on the retail speculation in Bitcoin. All right. Even now, people are going. I'm just going to sell some Bitcoin. There we <laughs> yeah. go. Um, so you mentioned cyber. You mentioned hacking. This is a huge concern for everybody in the room. It is an ongoing concern, of course. Every organization, I think it's fair to say, is doing its best to in some way secure itself on an ongoing basis. We had a fascinating conversation on this stage a couple of days ago, and um, one of the uh, top people at UCLA was, was so excited to take uh, her operation into the cloud because of the additional cybersecurity there. My question to you is, do you think regulators should play a role in the securing of organizations? Oh, I absolutely think so, um, even if it's just standard setting and, and putting out expectations about the cyber perimeter for um, financial, the financial system and for public companies. So the SEC, we tended to think about this in three, in three ways. One was the SEC itself is a repository of extraordinary amounts of data. All public company filings, even those that are filed confidentially, are with the SEC. There's trading data, there's enforcement and investigative data that if breached could lead to insider trading and, um, and all kinds of issues. The second way we think about it, and you all I'm sure read about the Edgar um, repository breach um, uh, that happened last year. The second way we think about it is from supervisory concerns. What have financial intermediaries done to um, strengthen their cyber defenses? What about exchanges? and um, the attempts by foreign actors in particular to try to breach exchange trading engines and potentially change stock prices would be a terrifying result. And then the third way, uh, which gets the most attention, and I think is really in some ways um, one of the most important things companies need to worry about, is what do you as a public company, in disclosing as you must do your material risks, and um, concerns in your filings say about cyber. And the SEC is pushing companies very hard. We actually did guidance, the first guidance in this area, when I was chairman. And we said to companies, you need to talk about cyber risk. What parts of your business could be impacted? What would the financial impacts be? What's the impact on customers, on intellectual property? What are the costs of securing your cyber defenses? What are the costs to you um, after a breach, um, how material could those be? And, and we, that guidance still lives at the SEC. It's still what's followed. I think the expectation is growing 
that there be more and more disclosure. Um, in the early days, the worry about disclosure was it'll be a roadmap for the next guy who wants to, to attack us, so we won't disclose right. that we've had a cyber attack, because then they'll know we're weak. Um, those days are gone, and there's a high level of expectation at the SEC that people actually do talk about these incidents and what the financial and operational impact of them has been on the business, because we as vest investors, owners of the company, have a right to know that information. So you see an SEC role, really, in enforcing organizations uh, in a very firm manner to look at the potential risks rather than in any way advising what should be done about it. Because I bet there are cynics out there who would say you know, a government entity is never going to know what corporations the SEC know. can't know. Um, they can't be expert enough in your business, whether you're a, you know, a, a freight shipping company or a healthcare company or a bank. They're just never going to have the expertise. No. They don't want the responsibility, and I don't blame them for that at all. Right. But, but what they want to do, as they do with all disclosure requirements, is say, you, the company, decide. But our expectations are for disclosure of material information that's useful to investors in making a decision about whether to buy or sell your stock. And I think companies are tending now to err more on the side of disclosure than not. Um, and you know, look, it's built over time, right? We think of Target and um, all the, the many um, major cyber breaches right. that have gotten a huge amount of attention. That attention alone is what drives it um, into the public disclosure realm. I'd love a little bit of behind the scenes if you could share with us, whatever you could share with us. I mean, back in the day you had set rules, and those rules would be in place for many years because not much else would change. But currently, there are so many breaking news stories, there is so much that happens. When you were at the SEC, how often would you have meetings where you would go, OK, these things have changed, this is what we need to talk about, this is what we need to suggest? So it's a great question, because I think um, the financial crisis can largely be laid at the feet of, of, of the foot feet of one problem, um, and it's something I've seen over my long career repeated often, which is that we tend to get in a bubble or the echo chamber, and we don't realize the world around us has changed. Right. And the failure to appreciate that, to bring in fresh blood, diverse uh, thinking into our organizations, the failure to listen to the person who thinks a little bit differently <laughs> about an issue can be fatal for companies. So at the SEC, we actually had a meeting every month of the entire senior team um, where we really tried to think about the off-the-wall scenarios that could happen and how would we be prepared for them. Um, I'll give you an example. We worried about when the Fukushima nuclear reactor blew up um, we sat down and said, okay, this can have an enormous impact on U.S. money market funds that hold Japanese commercial paper. And there are many, and it's a high percentage of commercial paper. Um, what else could happen that would have that same kind of impact on money market funds that might cause one to break a buck and cause a run as we had during the financial crisis? The willingness to sort of step out of the box and think about different kinds of things right. I think is critical <clears throat> in business and, um, and for regulators equally, and, and there's got to be a willingness to do that. The area of public disclosure evolves with important changes in, in society. So diversity wouldn't have been a big disclosure item 15 years ago. Certainly um, cyber wasn't a disclosure item 15 years ago. Those are huge front and center climate change as well front and center disclosure items today because the world around us changed. I, I love the fact that you would have these, I say hypothetical situations, they were, they were happening in other areas of the world, but you would actually get together and actually yeah. have those meetings. It was great, and I, I hired a guy who I love but was the most negative human being on earth. I mean, it was just <laughs> depressing to be in a meeting with him, but he forced me to, oh, thank you, he forced me to, um, to think about things I didn't want to think about. And he would never <laughs> let me get away with the sort of conventional wisdom on anything. And so my advice has always to been to CEOs, I, I won't use the guy's name, but hire this guy. Mr. Or Negative. somebody just like him, because it really, it's really valuable. Um, and he was often scarily right. We'll all, start, we'll all start looking now for Mr. Uh, oh, the world's falling apart. Great, come and join us. Yeah, we called and it. Tell well, us why. Behind his back, we called him Eeyore. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. 
Okay, so next question. Many companies use non-GAAP measures in reporting their financial results, and often these results aren't fully audited or described in financial reporting. How far do you see this as a problem, and, and what's the SEC's view? So I actually went back to look at some specific examples here because we had some doozies when I was at the SEC. And, and so let me say the, the good piece first. The use of non-GAAP measures is not an inherently bad thing. There are some times when the GAAP measure doesn't give you some nuance and subtlety and enough information um, that the company legitimately wants to share with analysts and investors. And the SEC is actually okay with that. Um, where they have a problem is when companies really push the limits. So um, uh, as when, um, I will tell you, um, Groupon, when they went public, and I hope I don't offend anybody in here, um, wanted a better um, earnings number, not surprisingly. And so they, um, they um, went public using what was clearly a misleading non-GAAP earnings measure called Consolidated Segment Operating Income. And essentially they took their GAAP earnings and they deducted all online marketing expenses. Well, that's all they have. <laughs> um, so you got a number that was crazy difference between the, the non-GAAP earnings measure and the GAAP earnings measure. Did you send them a message just, oh, that yes. just read, nice try? Yeah, yes. <laughs> I think it was more like, you have to be kidding. Um, Facebook, in calculating EPS, deducted all share-based compensation and payroll taxes. So it can go way too far. And the danger is, of course, it destroys the comparability of financial statements from different companies in the same sector. And again, to that point about who do I allocate my capital to within this sector, you, you gotta have numbers that you can compare one to the other. So, um, and I think it's also troubling that it can inflate compensation um, because you've got a, a compensation plan that's based off a number that really doesn't bear any resemblance right. to reality. So. Look, the SEC expects accuracy and transparency in how non-GAAP numbers have been created. They expect the GAAP number to be more prominently displayed and discussed than the non-GAAP number. Um, and they want to make sure that we're not confusing investors and creating, you know, a, a really a mythology um, around the company that just let's be honest, doesn't make any sense. But uh, again, it, it just taking a, a step back, the SEC, they, you all must sit there at the SEC knowing that everyone's going to probably have a go at something. And your role is just to catch them out and go, no, 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 and no. Yeah. Uh, would you be surprised if organizations simply did not try anything at all? But there's some that don't, and there's some that have been burned. I mean, and a couple of SEC enforcement actions in this space will cause everybody to clean up their act pretty quickly. But you know, the, the SEC process is a give and take, and some of you may be familiar with it, but when, when filings come into the SEC, the staff who are expert in that industry go through them and they send comment letters back and they say, what did you mean by this? And we think this is a, gap, a non gap measure that's not, um, accurately portraying the business and we, and we would like to see it removed and, or justify it. And so it's a give and take process that, that hopefully gets you to a better result Absolutely. Than, than the company just trying to slip through. But they do, I mean, they do. They do, they try, but they try. at the same time, they're educating you and your team. Right. They're right. showing you new approaches. You're going, oh, that's a good one. Yeah. We'll stop it, now yeah. we know. <laughs> um, let, we've had a most amazing conversations over the last couple of days about innovation and technology. Well, have you seen organizations leveraging technology to start to automate reporting? Have you seen innovations that impress you? Yeah, I have, and I think there's a ton exciting going on in the space, and, um, and a lot since I left the SEC, so I may not be as completely up to speed, but I think things like the use of natural language processing and the context of XBRL tagging and taxonomy extensions, but, um, and, and a number of other areas, but one that's particularly interesting to me as a regulator, because I think it has use for both companies and for the regulators themselves, is anomaly detection technology. Um, we're dealing increasingly as regulators with enormous data sets. Um, the SEC, for example, uh, we developed um, during my time, and it's uh, hopefully coming online here soon, the consolidated audit trail that will handle billions of pieces of data every single day because it will take an order and through its entire lifespan from generation of the order by the customer through modifications, cancellations, routing to different execution venues and ultimate um, 
uh, consummation of the transaction and then reporting back. As you can imagine, many data points, many you know, billions of shares traded a day um, will yield enormous amounts of data. So I think um, being able to manage those kinds of data sets with technology is really going to be critical. And, and let's be honest, fraud de detection and prevention by companies, by banks, by exchanges, by self-regulatory organizations, and by the government really um, seems especially well suited to automation, I think. When I was at the SEC, we um, developed some technology in-house, and we're, we may not be the best at this, but um, we had a focus on insider trading. And one of our concerns was, again, because the amount of data coming through the markets is so massive, is how could we find, could we find accounts trading in parallel with a very high degree of consistency that seemed to be unrelated? And, and so we developed some technology that allowed us to do that and bring some very big cases where it turned out the common denominator was, for example, a law firm partner who had friends in different places to, with whom he'd shared inside information, and those different accounts traded um, very much the same way. We would have never been able to connect them if we wouldn't, weren't able to go through massive um, amounts of data. So I think, I think the opportunities are huge. I think in the market surveillance space, where you're looking for people trying to manipulate a market to be able to detect and then um, focus your resources in a much more fruitful way uh, is, is a tremendous opportunity. There must be times where the SEC feels like it's falling behind. Oh, no question. Because organizations are so fast, so agile at, 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 at having new innovation in their own organizations, and you guys might still yep. be behind the, the curve. No question. Regulators always feel that way. And, and when I got to the SEC, um, the technology was in terrible shape. Virtually the entire SEC technology budget about $100 million a year at that time, had gone to XBRL tagging. And my view was, wait a minute, the taxpayer shouldn't pay for that. Let's let the accounting standards setters pay for that. And let's take that $100 million and redirect it towards um, automated detection of problems. I think it's going to be really interesting to watch. You may have read in the papers yesterday that FINRA, where I served as CEO for, for many years, which is the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority, has launched an investigation of whether the VIX, the volatility index that trades on the CBOE, has been manipulated by, um, by multiple traders buying options um, on VIX um, uh, stocks. And it, that's going to require some serious technology to be able to figure that out because the volumes in the VIX are huge. They're massive. Yeah. Um, so you would have to crunch a ton of numbers yeah. to try to find a pattern, because that's what you're looking exactly. for. Exactly. You're looking for patterns. Yeah. That's fascinating. Patterns and outliers. So you, I, I wonder how often people at the SEC will take a lead from organizations uh, like the fabulous people in this room Absolutely. and what they're doing. Absolutely. Um, what you can do to help educate the SEC about the technologies that are available is, is genuinely a public service because they have limited resources um, and they have limited capabilities. Because they're on an annual budget process, it's very hard to even build technology over a more than one calendar year or one uh, fiscal year time frame, companies like Oracle could be enormously helpful to the, to the public. Let's um, change the subject slightly now to something that grabs a lot of headlines, executive pay, the reporting of executive pay, incentive plans. What's your view of the current state of play? So I think, look, look there's a, there's a um, well-grounded, long-running set of disclosure obligations in the, in the executive compensation area that I think always fuel interesting um, newspaper articles, but are, again, important for us as owners of companies to understand the compensation plans. I think there's a couple of interesting things that have happened. One is Dodd-Frank gave shareholders an advisory vote on compensation plans. So, um, and in a couple of companies, shareholders have, in fact, voted down the compensation plan. It's not a binding vote, but it has caused the comp committees and the boards to go back and relook at how they've structured compensation in those companies. The second um, development is um, coming online now, and it's called the pay ratio. And it compares the CEO's compensation to the median pay of the employees of the company. And that is going to get, it was done under Dodd-Frank, hugely controversial. Mm. It will show the income gaps in this country in a very stark way. 
And, and is, you believe that's a good thing? Well, I'm not, I'm not actually sure because I think it's, I think the issues are actually more nuanced than a, a simple pay ratio is right. going to demonstrate. But it's a number the press can grab and go, can look, grab this And companies that. will be comparing themselves to each other and it's going gonna, it's gonna to be quite, uh, it, it, there will be a lot of upheaval, I think, when these numbers start to come out this year. Um, so uh, so we'll, we'll see on uh, that And if one, I may, the result of, of that sort of number comparison, you could argue, would e you have a choice, right? We either raise all the employees' wages to such an extent that the ratio then corrects, or we reduce the CEO's right, pay. Right. So I'm guessing your bet is that CEO pay will come under a lot more pressure. It, it will come under a lot more pressure, or... or there will be a lot more pressure for everybody to cluster in the same ratio. So, you know, you can't really, and that's what's happened with pay, pay programs anyway, right? We, you know, we compare ourselves to our peer group and we want to be right in the middle of our peer group. Well, everybody wants to be right in the middle of our peer group because then we're not going to be singled out right. as an outlier. So I, I think we'll, we'll see some of that phenomenon. But look, over the past five years, CEO pay has continued to grow. Um, I do think there's been an increasing proportion of that pay um, in stock awards, and I think we've seen a concerted effort by companies to link pay and performance, and, and I think that, that's a very positive development. And does performance always have to be a radical increase in profit, so can performance be uh, the prevention of a disastrous year or period of time? I c it can be, and boards certainly have the flexibility to consider what are the macroeconomic factors um, that influence the company's business, or what are the cyclical trends in this particular industry. Um, but I think, look, in the UK, I, um, I joined my first, um, they called a REMCO there, Remuneration Committee. We call it a comp committee in the US. I joined the f for the first time a REMCO um, last year. It's, this is an enormously complex area. And, you know, as a regulator, complexity, uh, complexity, opacity, and the echo chamber are the three things that scare me the most. And I always wonder whether these things really need to be this complicated with so many components to compensation programs. Um, but, you know, I think these um, shareholders say, say on pay votes will start to expose some of that complexity. Mary, our time's almost up, so I wanted to close with perspective on your role as the first female chairman of the SEC. Uh, it's a cliched phrase, isn't it, but you were a female in a very male environment. What advice do you have for female attendees in this room? And when you look back at your time, uh, what are your reflections on that moment? So the reflections first, I think, um, look, I'm often asked what am I most proud of, and I have to say it's walking into an agency um, that's critically important to the success of our economy, but that was basically on its knees. I was nominated one week after Bernie Madoff was arrested. The five largest investment banks in the US had either failed, been sold, or converted to bank holding companies so they would be in stronger regulatory hands. There had been no investment in technology. Morale was terrible. The press was vicious about, um, about the SEC and its failures. And um, it, the place was very siloed, and uh, we lacked the skill sets necessary to be a modern day regulator. And I assembled a fantastic team of people who were highly collaborative, very expert. We moved our technology investment away from data tagging and into other areas. We uh, brought in new skill sets, we brought in traders, we brought in analysts, economists, to try to round out our accountants and lawyers who we love, but we needed some more experience. We refocused our agenda on um, investor protection issues, and we communicated constantly um, what our vision was for the SEC and why it mattered. And frankly, we took accountability and responsibility for the Madoff failure that the agency had missed this Ponzi scheme that devastated lots of people and lots of institutions, and there really wasn't a good excuse for it, and we needed to acknowledge that and lay out a plan for how we were going to ensure that that never happened again. So those are things that, um, when I reflect on my time there, as hard as it was, um, I'm really proud of, but I'm really proud of the team because uh, you, don't do the, you don't do any of this by yourself. No. And you all know that from working in a great company. You don't do anything on your own. And part and of your role great. was to get them back into a mindset where they could actually rise again. Exactly right. Exactly right. And so, and so your advice to our female attendees? So, look, I think um, 
you've got to be um, comfortable taking some risks, and you've got to grab opportunities, I think, that are outside your comfort zone. And when you do that and you succeed, then you're comfortable to do it again and again and again. And, and that, having that confidence in your abilities, um, I think, is really important. Uh, look, my, my belief is women are problem solvers. We are risk takers, but we think through the risks before we do that. We're collaborators, we're long-term thinkers. We have a broad perspective that business absolutely needs to recognize as, as important strengths. But at the same time that you're grabbing opportunities, you need to be a great team player. You need to move ahead with humanity and humility um, because nobody wants to work with somebody who thinks that, that it is all on them, that they are doing it all, that they're not part of, of a bigger ecosystem. Um, and then I would say when you get to the top, reach out and pull another woman up alongside you. I like that. Those are wise words. Um, Mary Shapiro, thank you for coming into our event today and for sharing incredible insight. We are absolutely, truly grateful. Ladies and gentlemen, Mary thank you. Shapiro.